joke is a display of humor in which words are used within a specific and well-defined narrative structure to make people laugh and is usually not meant to be interpreted literally. It usually takes the form of a story, often with dialogue, and ends in a punchline, whereby the humorous element of the story is revealed. This can be done using a pun or other type of word play, irony or sarcasm, logical incompatibility, hyperbole, or other means. It is generally held that jokes benefit from brevity, containing no more detail than is needed to set the scene for the punchline at the end. In the case of riddle jokes or one-liners, the setting is implicitly understood leaving only the dialogue and punchline to be verbalized. However, subverting these and other common guidelines can also be a source of humor. The Shaggy Dog story is an example of an anti-joke. Although presented as a joke, it contains a long drawn-out narrative of time, place and character, rambles through many pointless inclusions and finally fails to deliver a punchline. Jokes are a form of humor, but not all humor is in the form of a joke. Some humorous forms which are not verbal jokes are, involuntary humor, situational humor, practical jokes, slapstick and anecdotes. Stand-up comics, comedians and slapstick work with comic timing and rhythm in their performance, and may rely on actions as well as on the verbal punchline to evoke laughter. This distinction has been formulated in the popular saying a comic says funny things. A comedian says things funny. The last place one could, or should think of a joke, is on an execution gurney waiting for execution. The death row joke Esther, Patrick Bryan Knight, he wanted to say a joke before his execution, and he did at the end, a little bit of levity is needed, Knight had said of the mood on death row and it seems to be working. I just want to go out laughing. I'm not trying to disrespect anyone. I know I'm not innocent. Patrick Bryan Knight also known as Dead Man Laughing, Patrick came from a highly dysfunctional family background. Alcohol abuse was reportedly common in the family and became a common factor throughout his adult life including being heavily under the influence at the time of his later offenses. When Knight was four years old, he was found at the bottom of a swimming pool with a tricycle on top of him. He required emergency hospitalization and experienced seizures for at least a year afterwards. From the age of nine, he was taken to psychologists on a number of occasions due to behavioral problems. At the age of 13 he dropped out of school. Patrick Knight and a companion, Robert Bradfield, broke into the home of Knight's neighbors, Walter and Marianne Werner, on Monday morning, August 26, 1991, after the Werners had left for work. When the Werners came back home that evening, Knight and Bradfield locked them in the basement of their home. The Werners were held captive in their basement that night and the next day, during which Knight and Bradfield drove around in the Werners' vehicles. Knight lived in a trailer next door to Walter and Marianne Werner in Amarillo. On the 26th of August 1991, after the Werners left for work, Knight, then 23, and Robert Bradfield, 19, broke into their home. Around midnight on Tuesday the 26th of August 1991, Knight bound, gagged, and blindfolded the couple, forced them into their own van, and drove them to a location in the country about four miles away from their home. He made them get out of the van and kneel, and then he shot each of them in the back of the head, execution style. He dragged their bodies into a ditch on the side of the road and returned to his trailer house and went to sleep. Knight was questioned by law enforcement officers investigating the couple's disappearance. After an initial denial, he confessed to abducting and murdering them and led investigators to their bodies. 
testimony at the punishment phase of Knight's trial indicated that he had destroyed part of a fence and shot and killed several head of cattle belonging to another neighbor. He was on probation for burglarizing a grocery store at the time of the murders. The state also presented evidence that on the same day as the murders, Knight went to Ted Ramirez's home and threatened to kill him and also went to Deborah Martin's home and told her that he would get her and her boyfriend. While in jail awaiting trial, threatened to kill a cellmate with a shank made from a coat hanger. He hid razor blades, scissors, and sharpened paper clips in his cell. A jury convicted Knight of capital murder in September 1993 and sentenced him to death. The Texas Court of Criminal Appeals affirmed the conviction and sentence in March 1996. All of his subsequent appeals in state and federal court were denied. Robert Timothy Bradfield was convicted of capital murder and sentenced to life in prison. He remains in custody. The case drew attention first from the international judiciary on the grounds that in order to pass a death sentence, a Texas capital jury must unanimously find the defendant would pose a future danger to society if allowed to live, even in prison. During Knight's sentencing the prosecution presented 16 witnesses, including jail staff and other inmates, to support a future dangerousness finding. Nearly half of the witnesses brought forward testified about the defendant's alleged bad conduct in the pre-trial detention period only and the defense presented no mitigation witnesses at all. A post-conviction affidavit from the lead defense lawyer revealed that because he believed there was little doubt about his client's guilt, he had focused on investigating potential mitigating evidence rather than witnesses and claimed that the investigations had been of little use, even to a mental health defense. Knight's mother and grandmother indicated to the defense that they did not wish to help Knight and moved from Amarillo without notice and could not be reached further. The claim of Knight receiving a constitutionally inadequate representation at sentencing was rejected by appeal courts, regardless of judicial commentary on such. The claim centered around one of the discussion's witnesses, Cynthia Risley, who was a guard at the jail where Knight was held pre-trial. She had originally testified in the trial that she was part of the team that had found makeshift weapons in his cell that he had a bad temper, and that she would be afraid of him if it weren't for a metal door between them. All appeals were denied and an execution date was set for Patrick Bryan Knight. A few months before his execution date, Knight wrote to Doreen Hawk, a Massachusetts death penalty opponent, about spreading the word that he wanted joke submissions for his last statement. At first Hawk found the request disturbing because Knight was making a joke out of something as grave as capital punishment. But eventually she came to accept Knight's gallows humor. He knows they're going to do it, said Hawk, so he might as well go out laughing. Hawk set up a MySpace page called Dead Man Laughing to publicize the contest. And soon the press picked up the story. Knight said the idea for a joke as his last statement came after a friend, Vincent Gutierrez, was executed in March 2007. Gutierrez laughed from the death chamber gurney. Where's a stunt double when you need one? Two months earlier, Knight, Gutierrez, and about ten other inmates participated in a hunger strike at the Polanski unit in Texas to protest conditions Knight described as deplorable. Knight was one of the last inmates to end the strike and claims he started the joke contest in part to ease the tension of the conditions on death row. I'm not trying to get any money. I'm not trying to get any pen pals or anything like that. It's just, jokes are needed back there. We need some kind of hilariousness. Many of the jokes received have, not surprisingly, dealt with death and the legal system. Lawyer jokes are real popular, Knight said. 
I'm not going to use any profanity if I can find the one I want, or any vulgar content. It wouldn't be bad if it was a little bit on the edge. That would be cool. Inmates on Death Watch will determine the best joke, according to Knight. The winning joke will be kept secret up until the time of his execution. The joke will be posted on his MySpace profile, unless a stay of execution is granted. On June 26, 2007, condemned prisoner Patrick Knight picked a tough room and a tough crowd to deliver a joke. Then he died with no funny joke, near tears and no laughter. I said I was going to tell a joke, he said, strapped to the Texas Death Chamber gurney for lethal injection for abducting and killing an Amarillo aerial couple almost 16 years ago. Death has set me free. That's the biggest joke. I deserve this. His voice wavering and appearing to hold back tears, he thanked God for his friends and made a plea on behalf of fellow inmates he said were innocent. And the other joke is that I am not Patrick Brian Knight and y'all can't stop this execution now, he added. Go ahead. I'm finished. Nine minutes later, he was pronounced dead making him the 18th inmate executed that year in the nation's busiest capital punishment state. His last meal was fried pork chops and chicken, along with garlic toast and ice cream. Thank 